so uh, let's say a lot have been going on within Red Hat, so I wasn't actually sure which background I needed to put in here. So maybe you like this one better. <laughs> so but I don't know, I choose uh, red uh, at the end, so we'll go with red. Anyway, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Antonio. I work with Red Hat or IBM, whatever. Um, I'm a software engineer uh, leading the MCO or machine config operator team uh, in OpenShift. And today's presentation uh, is about, you know, coming from nowhere and understanding the huge land in Kubernetes uh, with respect to controllers and operators. Uh, the whole talk is shaped around my experience and my team's experience uh, and all the gotchas and pitfalls that we had to learn you know, on our way uh, towards writing uh, a core operator for OpenShift 4. But this applies to almost you know, any controller or operator that you might want to write. Uh, or you might be tasked with. This was better though. Uh, anyway, uh, just to give you a rough idea of what we'll be discussing today, I'll introduce uh, controllers and specifically the controller pattern uh, within Kubernetes, which is, you know, it's the skeleton that you're going to use when uh, you write, of course, controllers and operators. Uh, and then we'll dive into, you know, differences between what makes an operator uh, compared to a controller. Um, and then I'm going to show all of this using the MCO, the machine config operator, uh, which is the operator my team has been writing for the past few months. Um, and then, you know, meanwhile, we'll, I'll also do a live demo of hopefully that is going to go well. Um, and then cross check whatever we uh, I've been uh, talking about before with, uh, you know, the code, invisible code. So first thing first, uh, the controller pattern is uh, an extension pattern uh, in Kubernetes. Uh, much of the Kubernetes behavior is implemented through controllers. Uh, an example would be the daemon set controller, uh, where it makes sure that um, all available uh, replicas of the daemon set are, are running at that given time. Um, and the controller is actually made of, uh, the controller pattern is actually made of other, you know, little pieces that make it a controller. And the first one, this snippet comes from the MCO code base. It's pretty simple. Uh, a controller does have a control loop. The control loop is nothing more than, guess what, a loop that keeps running forever unless something panics. Um, and then what it does is basically um, dequeuing items from AQ, which we're going to look at uh, in the next slides, and then run a sync handler, handle any potential error uh, you know, coming from the sync handler, and then keep going forever and ever. Uh, the queue, this is just, you know, this is the queue that we initialize in one of the controller uh, in the MCO code base. Um, the queue, um, you know, is the bucket where uh, whenever there's something that the controller has to, you know, reconcile or process, uh, we take the items from, from a queue. How the queue is filled uh, is through something called, you know, shared informers, because uh, basically the queue holds uh, Kubernetes object that, you know, change it and that we're interested into in our controller. Uh, this is um, this just initialize uh, a you know a pod informer. The informer is nothing more you know than a concept of I want to be informed whenever something uh, in the pods object in the API server changes. I want to be notified about that so that you know I can run my own logic in the controller. So that just initialize it, but then. Um, Every informer is also uh, a set of callbacks that those are fired whenever you know one of the specific callback is actually invoked. Say, in this example, we're interested into the pods, 
So when something or someone changes a pod in the API server, then if it's adding a pod, you know, this is super, yeah. Uh, if it's adding a pod, we'll get you know the add function called. Same for update and same for delete. What those uh, callbacks are basically doing is you know stuff like filtering out if you are really interested into that pod. Maybe that pod is an NA space that we don't want to you know care about or. Yeah, or similar tasks, but in the end of every of this uh, callback, there is actually a call to enqueue an object in the queue, uh, so that the sync handler, which is the core of every controller, can actually act on then on that object. The sync handler is, the, I say, this is, is the core because the sync handler of a controller is actually the one that you know, as all the logic for the controller itself. The usual task for a controller would be, uh, I have a desired state for an object. Uh, the sync handler would, you know, read the desired state, uh, you know, process the object, and turn that desired state into the current state of the object. After this run, you know, the loop continues forever and ever. I think the best analogy uh, I have for the controller is actually a state machine. So there's something there looping, then if something triggers or fires, then we, you know, we process, and then we go back to step one and keep running. This is, uh, this is also another, you know, super useful uh, concept that, you know, sharing informants are providing. Listers are read-only getters and listers. We use those in controllers because there may be so many controllers on a running clusters, so that this is a, uh, listers are just a read-only cache, so that you can get and list object of any given kind. In this case, it's a pod. Uh, we're using those to avoid uh, you know, eating the API server back and forth, uh, you know, basically to, to avoid to overload the API server. And I'll show you how we're using those in, um, in the code as well. So this is basically, those are basically the basic concept behind uh, behind the controller pattern. If you're interested, uh, this is this sample controller, which is something the Kubernetes uh, community came up with as a, I say a reference implementation, but I learned that it's not actually, you know, doesn't contain any, every uh, behavior that you, you could, you know, implement to your controller. But if you're interested, this contains uh, so many useful uh, patterns that you can actually even copy paste in your controller. And then operators. Uh, so what's the difference between a controller and an operator? I, I really struggled with the definition that you can find online at the CoreOS um, webpage. So what I came up with was an operator is nothing more than an application that implements the controller pattern, and that means it can also contain more than one controllers within a single operator. It has an API extension, and that translates to a write. The logic of the operator itself is driven by CRDs, usually, uh, or custom resource definitions. And there is a single app focus. Uh, this, I guess the best example to explain the last point is, um, you know, the, probably the most famous operator, which is the coach base operator. You have a database. Uh, that operator is focused on, you know, the whole life cycle of, the, of that database. It makes sure that there are all available replicas uh, across the cluster. You know, if something goes down, uh, it takes action and bring another replica up and stuff like that. Um, but then, you know, there was this confusion, so, um, if operators use the controllers, those are controllers as well, but it, that's actually not true because you need to have the single app focus and the API um, you know, extension. So there are controllers, especially in Kubernetes, that are just controllers. Um, you know, the node controller, the daemon set controller, those are controllers that act on just on Kubernetes, native Kubernetes object. And then 
yeah, the MCO. The MCO stands for the machine config operator. Um, I'm not gonna fully dive into the MCO, but I use it, you know, as a reference to explain what we've been, what I've been discussing before. Um, but the MCO, what it does, it makes sure on an OpenShift 4 clusters uh, that the configuration that you know a cluster admin or a user want uh, is actually is owned by the cluster itself, so that you know in. Let's say you want to add a node to a running cluster, then Kubernetes itself and OpenShift knows how to configure the node. Um, and also, it's responsible for uh, you know, upgrading the running uh, operating system that we run on every node. This is a huge topic, but suffice to say that on OpenShift 4, we are running uh, every node, at least in the control plane, runs on something called RHEL CoreOS, uh, which is a, an operating system built on top on OS3, and that allow, allows us uh, you know, to deliver atomic upgrades, and then the MCO is going to manage you know, to apply the update and reboot. I'm going to show you, well, not the upgrade, but we're going to see how it does that. Uh, so yeah, the key takeaways for, for the machine config operator is that the cluster itself is actually controlling the operating system. Um, and this, is, this has been super powerful because since uh, the, you know, the configuration is there, so you know, a cluster admin can drive whatever he wants related to the operating system through the cluster itself and through Kubernetes. So if you want to, let's say, add a file to, a, you know, to the nodes, you're going to do that using native Kubernetes object, like a CRD. Um, and this is actually the, the core piece um, within the MCO. Um, this is part of the API extension that I've talked before when I highlighted you know, the operator differences between operators and controllers. Um, this CRD does nothing more than, you know, this is an intent to write a file at Etsy test with the test you know, as content. So, you can see that we're driving configuration changes from Kubernetes itself, from you know, from the command line as well. And I'm introducing these CRDs so that we can go through the code later on. Um, the other um, important CRDs that I wanted to talk about is the machine config pool. The machine config pool is a concept of grouping um, machines that has a you know the same role. Say you have like in this example, this is a default OpenShift 4 installation. We have three masters and three workers, and of course we have three pool, uh, We have two pools: one from the master and one from the worker. What the pool does, uh, other than grouping. Uh, you know, same role machines is also grouping together all the machine config for a given role. Like this, this say test, but uh, this can be like worker or masters. And so, what the pool does uh, is grouping also all the machine config for a role, generating you know a huge machine config that takes uh, all the changes that we want on the nodes, and then you know apply that. And you know. This can be seen here, like the the name of the config is rendered dash because it's the you know it's the union of all the machine config for any given pool. Um, this is what drives OS updates um, within the MCO. Uh, this leverages again RPM OS three so that. Um, this is just an example of well the the config map that contains you know the actual the actual payload for that given upgrade. So what it happens is that with this config map we're able you know someone updates it like even Red Hat can push an update, um, and then this config map is changed. The OS image URL is changed, and then what the MCO will do is read this unpack you know this container image which, which contains nothing more. Than then an RPM, uh, then an OS3 diff, apply the upgrade and reboot. And it will do that on every node in the cluster. Um, yeah, so the demo is actually uh, pretty simple. 
sincronicidad So what we're going to do, um, and this is to explain how controllers and you know the whole MC operator is working with respect to just the operator concept. What we're going to do is create a CRD and cross-check with the code on Visual Code uh, what is actually happening uh, with respect to the flow that I showed before. So this machine config is basically saying, I want this file as C test with test as content deployed on every worker. Um, we have three workers and three masters, so we're going to cross-check also that this file is actually on, you know, at least on any worker, because it may take some time to actually roll out to every, uh, to every node. So the first thing we're going to do is create... Uh, So what, we've, what I've done just now was creating a CRD, well, a, machine, a manifest uh, containing the machine config, um, you know, spec for, uh, for the machine config. So if you remember from before, uh, Every controller has a, you know, an event handler for the object it's interested in. And so this, this first one is the render controller. You know, the MCO is something like five or six controllers itself. This is the very first one that when you create the machine config, uh, CRD is going to take action. And that's because uh, you can see here when a machine config is added into the API server, this controller is interested into, you know, knowing that a machine config has, has been added. And so from here, um, you know, this is the this is the informer callback. This contains so many stuff, but you know, as I said before, the most important part is that this piece of code, the callback, is going to enqueue an, ob an object, uh, in this case it's a machine config pool, that then it's interested into when it runs the sync handler. And so you can actually you can actually check that. Yeah, you can see this is a call to actually enqueue uh, the machine config pool, and then after you know sometimes uh, you'll see. So this actually triggered, you know, when the when the machine config pool was added into the queue for the render controller, it triggered, you know, the sync handler for this uh, controller. And what this what what you know this sync handler has done was basically generating a you know the rendered machine config, so a group of machine config for the worker pool, uh, you know, and generated a new one. And what it did was just upgrading, uh, updating another CRD, uh, which is the machine config pool here, and it changed it, you know, this field here, right? You're still following, still with me, somehow? Okay. And so, so, so we changed the machine config pool CRD. So we changed yet another object, and guess what? We have another controller, which is actually interested into understanding uh, if the machine config pool CRD uh, is actually changed, and that's the node controller. So we have a node controller, and what happened was the node controller is interested into you know any change that happens on the machine config pool objects so we change it well the other controller changed the machine config pool and so we are here again we're gonna uh, enqueue the machine config pool again and what the node controller does uh, it's running its sync handler which at the very end it's going to do nothing more than, you know, adding an annotation to an odd object, um, and this this can be cross-checked with this. 
see that this rendered machine config is nothing more uh, than, than you know what we had here, uh, and so you know following the flow from before, we added the machine config, we created the new rendered one, which is this one, and then the node controller told, you know, added an annotation to the node to say, all right, I want this configuration for that node. Uh, in this case, it's a worker node. And so following along again, uh, now our nodes, sorry, our node is this desired config, so guess what? We have um, yet another controller which listens on node object changes, um, and this is the daemon controller. What this does, again, as this has a, uh, you know, an informer callback so that when a node is updated, we take action on that. And this is, again, doing nothing more than uh, and queuing the node object so that when the scene handler for the node controller runs, you know we can take action on uh, on it. And what this is basically doing is reconciling the state of a node to what you know the user wants. In this case, we wanted to add a file, so with this code, which I'm not going to show because it's huge, uh, what this code does is basically. Uh, we have a desired state, which is reflected from that annotation. So this code is gonna, you know, in this case, is gonna write a file and then reboot the machine, um, making sure that the desired config is actually the same as we want in the current one. And hopefully, we landed that file. So there have been three controllers involved. Uh, in this case, just to land the file, but imagine what this can, you know, can do. Uh, and for the MCO use case, this is pretty powerful because we're able to, again, configure you know, the node and have this configuration stored in Kubernetes itself. Uh, and you know, in scaling scenarios when, you know, if I'm going to add you know, a, an additional node to the worker pool, what that node would do is ask Kubernetes itself, all right, give me the configuration for a worker, uh, and then you know, the MCO will run on that node, configure the node as Kubernetes says. So this has uh, been pretty, pretty powerful. So the MCO did. Um, you mean at C test? That does that? Yeah. So the one responsible to actually writing that file or any file that you know you specified in a machine config that it, and that it's part of a machine config pool uh, is actually written. You know the state of the of the of the node itself of the system itself is managed through this controller and specifically this sync handler. I can actually go through the place where we actually wrote that you know that file. Um, so the first thing we did in this scene handler was grabbing the node um, so that you know we can read its annotation, understand you know which configuration we want, and then you can see here that since the annotations for current and desired weren't the same, we actually acted on that, and so what that did was trigger an upgrade, an update. And so we jump it here, and this is doing stuff. This is actually the piece of code responsible you know, for uh, reflecting what's in the machine configs and what's on the disk, on the actual operating system. Um, 
yeah, here we're doing a lot of stuff, but what we're basically doing it's this function. We have a you know we have an old state and a desired state, so we're gonna diff them and understand you know this file must be added, this must be dropped, uh, you know, and later on, well, what it does there. Yeah, you can see here, we actually were diffing two machine configs to understand what differs and acts on that. And then if it's reconcilable, you know, this, this is actually the, the function that actually writes that file to disk. But other than that, we're also responsible for doing so much other stuff, like um, you can write files, you can write systemd units, you can, you know, we can upgrade the whole underlying operating system. And, you know, you can upgrade SSH keys, uh, kernel arguments, FIPS, FIPS mode. Well, the discussion might be out of the session, so it's better There's no end to the code. Say it again? Ansible. Oh, there's no Ansible, no. Uh, the, maybe I missed this, but... No, oh, I'm done. Thanks. The, you can see from a machine config that it contain the spec of the machine config itself uh, is nothing more than ignition. I don't know how many here are familiar with ignition itself, but it's a way, you know, it's a declarative way of specifying, uh, you know, the state uh, of a system. In this case, it's similar to Ansible. I'd say I can say that. Can I say that? Okay. Uh, but then, you know, the, the ignition part is, you know, the actual part that drives all of this. Um, and well, lastly, just to follow up on, on, on your question again, uh, this is also the part where we're actually going uh, and upgrade the, over, the underlying operating system if we're really interested into doing that as well, if we have an upgrade coming. So, okay, I maybe I went too fast, maybe, but this is actually a quote from one of my colleague, Luca. Uh, I, you know, the whole team, the whole MCO team was coming from nowhere. We were, I was working on Docker, Cryo, and stuff like that. Other people were working on, you know, operating system, and what we learned was that it was not that straightforward to jump on, on Kubernetes. Uh, and so he, he told me like, all right, Antonio, you used to work to play checkers, but now, you know, the whole Kubernetes land is chess. And I can actually feel that because uh, there are so many moving parts, even in writing a, uh, you know, a, an operator like the MCO, which, you know, can, I can say like maybe it's easy to follow as I did in this presentation, but when there is a bug at this level, it's you know nothing is straightforward. So that's why it's just you need to be you know three steps ahead uh, to understand what's going on. Um, the yeah, this is just you know a narrow list of our gotchas and pitfalls that we run through uh, during you know our lessons uh, in understanding Kubernetes controller. Uh, the first one was uh, you should never invalidate the listers cache. Uh, as I said before, the listers are nothing more than a read-only layer. So if you grab an object and you mean to update it, like even changing uh, a field or adding an annotation, you should copy it. Because otherwise, if you are um, if you are changing it and updating it to the API server, that's gonna cause, again, uh, a, a cache miss for everything else. So that's really expensive. So always deep copy. We learned this, about this. We weren't sure what was going, what was happening. Um, the other thing that we learned was, I'm gonna show you this in code. Uh, the informer is again a way of staying informed about a specific object, uh, but then imagine you you have a pod informer, so and you have uh, 1,000 users, you have 1,000 users on your clusters, each of them creating a pod, so your informer is gonna get flooded with you know. Uh, 
with all the this you know callback for adding a pod. So what we learn because we were wrongly running a sync every time we had an object changing. It wasn't the pod. The pod is an example of you know uh, there are so many that you can get floated. So what we learned was that there is a way to actually uh, filter. Um, the informer so that um, so that if you're interested in two pod objects, you can say, all right, I want all the pods just for this namespace. Uh, imagine, so the issue we had was we were running a sync because there was another pod in another namespace that we weren't interested into, uh, and that was changing a lot, triggering a sync in the machine config operator. Uh, so what we had to do was actually leverage uh, one of the you know informers uh, function and just add a field uh, so that you know that pod in that many space wasn't actually causing any sync, any resync of the operator, and this can be found here. This is an example of uh, this is a shared informer for the config map. Uh, and we're just interested in the config map coming from the OpenShift config namespace. So that, you know, if there is a user creating a tons of config map, that's not going to cause any resync of the machine config operator. Um, yeah. The last thing, well, one of the last things that we learned was uh, Kubernetes as a concept of generation and observed generation. I'm going to show you that. So you can see here, you know, every object in Kubernetes is a generation. That's that number is increased every time someone changes the spec of the object itself. And then your operator, your controller, is responsible to you know, sync that with the observer generation. So when I change something in this object, in the spec of this object, that generation number is going to increase. Uh, and that, that means that the spec, so the desired state for this object, has changed, but we're still you know, on the status one, on the old one, because observer generation isn't matching that. And that, for us, was really hard to, to, to understand, because at the, at the end, we had a bug where we weren't actually, you know, we were playing just with the status field of the object, and that reflects the current state, not the desired state. So we were only playing with the status. We were, you know, updating field in this status configuration name. Uh, and but then in the code we were actually comparing uh, you know generation and observer generation. And that was all right, there was always one, for instance, because we weren't updating the spec. So we learned at our own expenses that you need to actually your object need to reflect a desired and a current state and you need to play with uh, generation and observer generation to understand where you're at uh, with the status of your object. Yeah, uh, and I added the last line uh, just yesterday because I've been asked like, why aren't you using Cube Builder or Operator SDK? Part of that is because um, some of the code in the MCO was written before we came, uh, and some of the controllers were already written, you know, plain, like like I showed you before. Those aren't using any Cube Builder, any Operator SDK, but we might want to, you know, uh, in the future look at, at those. But I'm not familiar with that. The team is not familiar with that um, yet. And I went too fast, but uh, that's it. <laughs> Questions? Lunch? I can't listen. Okay. I don't hear. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for your talk. Um, 
the, the, you have a test suite for this, and how how easy is it to to write tests for those various Free controllers? So there are, as, as in every test or testing, uh, there are so many ways to actually run a test for for this close. Uh, what we've been doing was a mix is a mix of you know end-to-end test and unit test take it as integration test. So well, the end to end test is pretty simple. We spin up a cluster, we run commands, uh, and make sure that everything reconciles the way we want. So this is the, the easiest one. Uh, but then, for every controller that we have somewhere, we're actually you know, faking uh, a run of the controller as it, you know, as, as it would be in a cluster. And so we're basically setting up a fake API server where we have all the object. And then we run the sync handler uh, with all the listers set up the way we want with the object we want. And then make sure that, you know, at the end of the day, the controller itself is just, I have a state, a desired state, and a current state. So the current one needs to be desired. You know, they have to match at some point. So that's the whole point of the sync handler. So what we do in testing is making sure that if you give you, you know, this input, this object, this way, in a desired state, we get what we want. And you know, testing also includes, you know, no hop. Say that you know your object is already a desired state, uh, but maybe the annotation, you know, what drives the difference isn't actually set. We're, we're testing also that. How long, does it, how long does it take to run the, the whole suite? Oh, oh yeah, the the end to end test is involving involves uh, spinning up a you know an sheet, a full sheet for cluster, so it takes around an hour and a half. But uh, the the actual unit test this is really fast. Well. It's not going to be now that I'm doing this live, but usually it's uh, a minute or something like that, even less, just the time to compile every suite. Uh, Anthony, I just want to add that with the end, -end test, does this turn on? Uh, we, you spin up the cluster, and then you run the full Kubernetes suite, right? All of our components do that. The MCO does that, too. So there's, like, thousands of Kubernetes tests being run. Uh, the core Kubernetes suite runs with all of our OpenShift components. I, I'm assuming MCO does that, too. Right. Uh, the AWS E2E Yeah, test, other or? than our own tests, we're also making sure that we don't break, you know, the full OpenShift test, which is a superset of the Kubernetes test as well. So we're running, I don't know how many, but a lot of tests. I, I looked the other day. I think it's like 2,200 and some. Yeah. That's a lot. Yeah. But yeah, the full, this full suite that you can see also on GitHub takes more or less one hour and a half, nothing more than that. Um, I'm very new to operators, um, like most of us, I guess. Um, when is an operator essentially a pod that's always running, or is that triggered based on event? Like, can you just go over the uh, life cycle of the, the of image the that is running? Um, so yeah, I'll show how the MCO works, well, with, with respect to pods and daemon set and deployments that we have. So the MCO you know, architectural structures is as follow. There is just a pod, which is the machine config operator pod. That's the operator code that syncs every other controller in there, because it's going to update an object, let's say an object, and then all the other controllers react to that when they need to. And so we have a deployment for the machine config operator that makes sure that we have the MCO uh, at any given time we have at least a replica on a master. And then the machine config daemon is the the last controller that I've showed, uh, and it's it's actually that's running on every node in the cluster because that's the one responsible for you know laying down files as I showed it before. So that that's a daemon set running on every node in the cluster. 
then the machine config controller is also a deployment running on a master and the three machine config server which would be a lot to explain what they are but those are running on masters as well as deployments and the top three as well are deployments so this is the structure of, of the whole MCO I don't know how other operators within OpenShift um, are actually laid out but I, I, I think are, you know this is the, the general structure Lunch. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, so, those of you who would be interested uh, for the party tonight at 7 p.m., please go collect your party uh, tickets at the registration desk. Uh, we'll resume here at 1:10.